we are going to jump tonight into our Bible study. And in doing so, we are going to be in the book of Haggai, which we were supposed to be in a few weeks ago, I think two or three weeks ago, and through different things of um, delaying it for a week. And then my folks were in town and we finally had that good day of weather. And so I selfishly delayed it another week so that we could enjoy that. Um, and we're going to jump into Haggai. And I promise it was always the plan from the beginning that we're going to hit it in one week and be ready to start Zephaniah next week. Because it's another short book in, um, in the book of the minor prophets here as we go through. So I'm going to give us a little bit of background on Haggai, and then we're just going to jump right into chapter one. We won't read every single verse, but we'll read enough to get the message and the understanding of it and have some conversation as we go. But um, if you remember, it was way far back now, but when we looked at Zephaniah, we had all of this background on Zephaniah. We knew back multiple generations where he came from, and we don't have that as much for Haggai. In fact, we have uh, much less information about him, but we do know specifically when he spoke and to whom he spoke, which is somewhat unique. And what's nice about Haggai is he's the first prophet who is speaking to the people after their return. Um, and because of that, and because we have the, um, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, we have other places in the Bible where we're receiving this same story from less of a prophetic lens and more of a historical lens. So we can kind of place them together and see what's happening within the story of God's people in these um, in these days and in these years. We know that Haggai spoke in the second year of King Darius. That's when his prophetic ministry began, and it was relatively short. It was only for a period of months that he was a prophet and was bringing messages to the people. And we also know that it was based on kind of cross references with Ezra, that this is probably about 15 or 16 years after they've returned to the Holy Land. So they've come back to Israel, they've started to reestablish themselves, but as we're going to see, um, Haggai's message is ultimately one about priorities and setting uh, correct and godly priorities to the people who up to that point had been somewhat lax in rebuilding the temple as they were rebuilding the land and getting ready to, um, to get into it. So we're going to start in Haggai 1. We'll read the first 15 verses, um, which really is, let me see here. I just write down the verses. I think that is all of chapter 1, but I promise we're not going to read the entirety of the book, but there's just a lot in here that I think it's good to read. So I'll read this for us, and then we'll have some questions and conversation through it. But um, in Haggai chapter 1, verse 1, it says that in the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, 
on people and livestock and on all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message to the, of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. Ugh. You say some of those names three or four times and your tongue starts to turn to rubber. Um, but what is the main, what's the main problem that Haggai is addressing in this chapter and so far in the book? What's going on here? Well, the people are just kind of selfishly taking care of themselves and um, have neglected the house of God. Yeah. They, and probably that means maybe even, I mean, because they had to bring, I mean, they probably weren't even doing any of their festivals or anything maybe mm -hmm. if they weren't doing anything at all um as traditions yeah how, I, I mean how many of us if you've had to move even if it's been just from house to house but certainly if you've moved from one city to another one state to another mm -hmm. it's a busy process You've got to pack everything up. You got to go through the logistics. You got to finally get to the place. You got to get your stuff moved in. You have all of these things that have to be done. And we do that in a kind of capitalist world. I think, I think Cordova is probably unique in the sense that there's still that seasonality to life that you say in the midst of doing that, you've still got to make sure that you're getting out and fishing, that you're harvesting, that you're getting what you need so you'll be able to survive through a winter and through the next year. There's a lot going on. And what the people have kind of done is as they got there, there was a lot to do. They had to get themselves established. They were walking into a land that they didn't remember. And so they've got to reestablish their fields and start planting again and getting ready. And we need to get our animals together and get ready to pin them in and be ready for whatever's coming next. There was so much work to do that I think that took some of that priority. But we also know that when they first got there, they were a little bit gung-ho about building the temple and getting that started. After all, they had a decree from the king who said, go and rebuild your temple. Go and do that. Um, does anybody know from the book of Ezra um, or just having your own knowledge from the past on why they stopped building the temple? Because at this point, it's been 15 years since they first got there. Anybody online know that one? Not for sure. Well, I hear it again. <laughs> it's an interesting situation where they started building just like the king told them to. Um, whenever Cyrus had called them to do this, but none of the neighbors around Israel particularly wanted them to rebuild this temple. And so they would go and harass them as they're building it. They would go, and that's when you read Ezra and Nehemiah about people coming and attacking, even as they're building these walls up and they're having to protect themselves as they do it. But they went beyond just physical threats and they started doing political threats as well. They would write letters to the king after Cyrus is gone and a new king's in command. And they say, you know, these people, the Israelites are rebuilding this temple. These people who rebelled against your kingdom, these people who are rebellious by nature, who have done all of these different things, they're starting to establish their own independence again. Are you aware of this? Are you concerned about this? You should be concerned about this. And they started essentially a a smear campaign against them in the midst of their rebuilding. And so they faced persecution and they faced roadblock after roadblock because they weren't getting any help. And in the midst of that, they were actually being stymied over and over again in their building. And it's part of what they say there in verse two, 
where they just say, you know, now's not the right time. The time has not yet come. This door just seems slammed shut as we move forward. So what do we do with this? Um, you know, they set it aside and set it on the back burner. We're not saying never, we're just saying not right now because clearly we're not gonna be able to get that done. And we've got other things that we really do have to do right now as they go through. Um, but let me ask theologically, and I think you don't have to overthink this one. This is not a gotcha question, but what does the temple represent for the people of God, even before the exile, even before Haggai is living and breathing here, before he's born, what does the temple represent? That's where they brought their sacrifices. That's where every atonement, everything. Yeah. That was where they honored God. Yeah, God's house. It's God's house. It's where they honor God. It's where they worship. It represents not only the, the meeting point between heaven and earth. It is also, as far as earth is concerned for the Israelites, this is the presence of God is in this place. The house of God. This is where God's glory, his kavod in that Hebrew language, his weight literally resides, is in this place, in the temple, as they go through. So in their hesitance and willingness to wait on building the house of God, the, the place that is the home of their worship, like you mentioned, Sandy, what message are they communicating both to God and to themselves? Sandy gave a non a nonverbal shrug. That's them. Yeah, big deal. We're, we're, we're doing what we gotta do and it'll happen but the when kind of, it happens. Kind of communicating is not as important as that's not a priority. It's not a priority from Darla, Susan saying the same thing. It's just not as important as some of those other things. Sandy kind of gave it the shrug and said, you know, it's, it, it'd be nice, but present realities are what they are, right? As we go through, the, the presence of God might not be necessary for them at this time as they're re rebuilding, or at least it's not a priority to seek out. There are other things that are priorities. We got to figure out where we're living, what we're eating. How are we going to get through the next year as they go through? But doesn't he say, you have all of that. Why are you centering everything on yourself? Yeah. Isn't that yeah. Part of it, really? And I think part of how this priority game works. And as I was thinking about this and kind of preparing it's easy to shake the finger at the Israelites as they go back and we can say, uh, you know, you really messed up your priorities as you went through here. But how many of us have been in this exact, this exact same spot, maybe not over the span of 15 years, for some maybe, where something goes on and something doesn't work out and the priorities just dictated in the moment and you say, I'd love to be able to go to church, to Bible study, to do this thing, to do that ministry, whatever it might have been, but the time is just not right. I'm way too busy. There's way too many things. It just didn't work out. It wasn't, I can't do it right now. I'd love to, but I just can't. I got to take care of all this other stuff. And then three months turns to six months, turns to three years, turns to six years, turns to I did mean to get back to that. Whatever happened, I used to do this, right? We can find ourselves in this exact same spiritual spot. And before we go wag the finger and judge the Israelites, they had the same intentions that we have in our world. And theirs, frankly, were more dire because for them, it really was life and death. For at least that first year, they were trying to worry about how to live. We don't always have that same dire life and death choice we're making, but part of what God's complaint is, I think there's a reason he didn't get on to him until year 16, and he said, I've been trying to call you back to me. I've been, you know, your crops aren't exactly producing the way you were hoping that they would, and the olive oil isn't exactly coming the way you thought 
that it might, I've been trying to call you back to worship, trying to send something. So you would say, what are we missing? Oh, wait, it's God. He's been trying to put it in their mind. And over and over, they haven't been getting it as they go. And so there's this kind of temptation to say, oh, we'll put that off. We'll put that off. And you're absolutely right, Darla. His complaint isn't, hey, you guys, before you build your own houses, build mine. His complaint is you're over there in your paneled houses. You haven't just figured out where you're living. You are putting the finishing touches on your homes before you've even completed mine now. Because that tends to be how this works. I mean, I could ask the question, I'm assuming it's universal. I know it is for me to say, have we faced that temptation? The temptation of verse two here to just say the time's not right for committing whatever it is that I know I should do, but it's just not the right time. If we did a, a raise of hands here, does everybody's hand go up? I won't ask for it. There's some people yeah. on right now, but yes, yeah, your name. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like I don't want to knock us in the head with it because we're all there, um, yeah. or we've been there at different times. Where's are there places specifically or are there general spots where you tend to face that temptation to set or you see it happen to set that priority of God aside for this reason or for that one? Maybe at different times in your life. Just at different times, whatever they might be. Well, I mean, like maybe when you have kids and they're younger, and you might think that they have to do something different. Or, yeah. I mean, I think it changes in your life. Mm -hmm. It can change from time to time and reason to reason. I will admit that I used to be far more judgy on this because, especially, you know, I've been a minister and I've worked in churches since it's been like 12 years now where this has been my primary work of working in churches and so for me coming to church on a Sunday is like not ever really been the option it's like I go, that's part of my work schedule is to be at church on a Sunday you you show up you do these things you do it whether I was an intern or a youth pastor or an associate pastor or a senior pastor you know a pastor here it's just what you do as you go and there was a brief little gap after when we before we came here, um, I had a gap of about a year where I wasn't working in a church. I worked at a Christian school as a campus pastor, and I worked on the side doing other things as well. But my weekends were mine, and I found myself, you know, those first weeks you say, "Oh, I'm going to take a break this week. It's I don't have to be at church on a Sunday. I'm busy from the week. I just want to rest this Sunday. I'm just going to take that. I haven't been able to do it." In, seven years. I'm going to take a Sunday. And so I take my Sunday. And then the next Sunday comes and I say, I'll try to go. And you go to a church maybe, and you don't find the one that just fits. Or you go and you say, well, that was nice, but okay. And then the next Sunday comes, and you say, I'm kind of missing that one where I got to do my own thing for a Sunday. I'm going to do that. And I found myself after the span of a few months, not being that regular in my worship. Because it was this little bit of freedom on the leash that I had been able to have where I was able to choose that priority. And I realized just how easy it is for it to mm -hmm. pop down on the list. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and to say, well, I'll go next week or I'm going to I'm going to listen to a sermon this week or I'm going to do this or that. You know, you find all those ways to rationalize it as you do. And that was kind of what I did. And then I realized I have been harsh with people, if not in my words, but at least in my mind, if they gave me the, oh, I couldn't make it last Sunday, this thing, that thing, whatever it might've been. And then I realized like, I am such a hypocrite because the moment I gave myself an inch of leeway, mm -hmm. I bolted because I wanted to sleep in or I wanted to do something on Saturday night or da 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 da, -da whatever it might've been. Um, and so I say that to say, we don't have to beat ourselves up, nor do we need to beat others up when we think about this and when we talk about it, but we can recognize it's endemic. It's all of us. It's a discipline thing and a priority thing. And it's so easy to let other priorities 
that feel urgent get in the way of what's important with our faith and with our worship. And I think even beyond our faith and our worship, but our service, because we can lie to ourselves. I did it and have done it where you say, I'm going to, I'm going to watch something online. I'm going to do this or that. I'm going to find those ways. I'll still get fed this week. And we turn our faith and we turn our church life or we turn our, our religion into something that satisfies us. I'm still going to get it. I'm going to tune in. I'm going to do this or that. And I don't say that to blast anybody who has to watch online, but it's a danger when we only watch online because church becomes something we consume and our faith becomes something of, well, it just pours into me and that's great. And we lose a lot of that communal aspect where it's also pouring out. Um, I think there's another aspect to this too. And yeah, please share. I mean, some of us are, you know, very good and regular and all that, but there are other things that God puts into our mind that we know we should do, uh, either visiting other elderly that need more, um, that just need to have us come. Um, and those kind of service things, I think those are, are uh, also something that we can just, uh, I'll do it tomorrow type of thing. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I, I, feel that yeah I think he was over here nodding the whole time you're talking Darla saying totally agree with you Darla that's where my weakness is we can find those spots where it can be difficult to to say but why 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 am I doing that yeah you know I still battle every once in a while rejection Mm -hmm. um and so I I think it might be that that well they 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 probably just don't even want to you know have me bothering them yeah i can talk myself out of it even even when i know it's the lord's unction on me i can talk myself out of it yeah when it comes to moving our faith or our service because i think those two are so tightly bound we are very good at convincing ourselves again not never just not right now i'll do it like you said darla i'm going to do that tomorrow i'll visit them i'll call them tomorrow i'm going to do this thing yes i do i've been meaning to do that it's on my list but we don't make it a priority we don't make living those things out and i guess if there's a message here at least in chapter one and a message for me as I was reading and prepping, it's that once we move God, whether it's our worship, our service, whatever it might be, once we move God from that number one spot on our list, it never stays at number two. Because once we've already made the decision in our head that urgent can take precedence, Mm -hmm. there's always something more urgent. You know, and once we've decided that we're not gonna say, well, that's important, that has to happen, I can always find something that's really urgent that I've got to do with my time right now, even if it's, I've got to get this load of laundry started. I've got to clean these floors. I got to take the dog out right now. He's whining at me. I got to do it. And once we start setting those things above and above and above, and we start doing it habitually, it doesn't mean, and I, it can be easy to get defensive and say, well, I did have to do that. And it's like, of course, go for it. Like, yeah, those things do happen where they come up. But when it becomes the pattern of our priorities and we say this week, it was this thing. And well, the week before it was that and the week before, and then we start asking ourselves maybe in a convicted sense, we say, when was the last time that I actually did say no to another priority when it came to my faith or my service? Or is it the thing that's able to go in the bucket as long as all the other rocks are already in? You know, once the bucket's filled, if there's room over, absolutely, I do this and I do that. And I'll go to church or I'll do this service thing with my extra time. And Haggai's, like, the word of the Lord is coming and saying, I don't want to be the last stone in your bucket. I want to be the first stone in your bucket. And then you'll find all the other ones fit a lot better. Because that's kind of what he's saying. Like, you'll find that your harvest is a lot better if you're putting me first, you know, those other things are going to work out a lot closer as we go through. Um, 
And I like that Haggai made a point that he's not just speaking to the entirety of every Israelite out there. He's focusing on the leaders of the community. And we heard it about 82 times in chapter one of he was speaking to um, Zerubbabel and to Joshua, the governor and the high priest as he goes through, because Haggai is trying to inspire them to recommit themselves and then saying, and those leaders will then inspire the people because God calls leaders to lead and to not stand behind the people and say, well, what do you guys want to do today? But to stand in front and say, this is our priority right now. This is where we are going to go because this is what God calls us to do. Um, And so I think that's really meaningful as we see that. And then you get this I mean, they responded. The people respond to Haggai positively. They recommit themselves to build from this moment. Um, And I wanted to see if somebody has it open and might be willing to read. um, Sandy, would you mind reading for us? In chapter two, just verses one through nine. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, speak now to Zerubbabel and the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. I love these verses. I mean, like, they just, they absolutely preach. Um, And it starts in this neat way. This is a after they've started this work and they're getting near to the end, they're really making progress. Timeline wise, do you think some of the people who are present for this building saw the former temple? I mean, we're talking about about 70 years or so. Maybe. Maybe. Somebody who might be there as a, as a senior member of this remnant of Israel who's returned might have seen the temple when they were kids as they've come back. And he says that they are the ones, and we see it in Ezra, when they they build the temple and you get this really emotional moment in the book of Ezra. When they look at it, this cry goes out and some of the people, the younger folks, are crying out with joy because they've built the temple and it's the temple, it's the house of God, we did it. We're recommitting ourselves. And at that same time, the older folks who are among the group are crying out in anguish because they saw the old one and they know, or at least they feel in their hearts, this doesn't hold a candle to what it used to be. Mm -hmm. And Ezra has this really beautiful line where it's like, you couldn't even tell the difference because everybody's crying out so loud in the moment and it's heard for miles around. But because we're reading it, we know this is intermingled joy and pain in that moment and Haggai is really speaking to that pain because he's saying if you are worried or if you are upset or if you're dismayed because you've seen what it used to be and now you say now I'm trying to you're recommitting yourself and it just doesn't work the same way doesn't feel the same as it used to as we go through what's what's God's promise in these verses for those that mourn what used to be and have that nostalgia he says that this will be better than what was. It'll and be. That I will be with you. Yeah, that's really it. I mean, that that line is the promise. 
I am with you and I am still with you. The same covenant I made when you left Egypt, I am with you. So do not fear. Uh, my spirit remains among you. And then you get that awesome promise where he says, I will make this place more glorious than the last temple as we go through, which if we want to think ahead here and say, how does, or how did, since that temple is no longer there, how did God fulfill that promise? That he brought more temple to the second or more glory to that second temple than the first. Which temple did Jesus visit? The second one. Yeah. This one that they've rebuilt. Okay, right. I thought of that. This is the one, like, whenever I read this and he's saying this idea of the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. God's presence was quite literally, physically in this second temple. And he says, in this place, I will grant peace it was this temple's veil that's torn. It's this temple where Jesus stood in the courtyards telling them about God and his, his kingdom and what was coming past this and how his presence wasn't just going to be reserved for those that could, um, you know, that qualified to enter into those inner courts. He's kind of reminding them it's not the stones and it's not the timbers that make the house of God glorious, but it's the presence of God in it. That's what brings that glory. Um, and it's, it's an encouragement to the people not to fear because even as they started rebuilding, the same things were happening that happened 15 years before the neighbors getting around and saying, what do you think you're doing? And trying to attack at them and sending word to King Darius saying, Hey, these people are rebuilding this temple. They're going to rise up against you. Aren't you nervous? What are you going to do as they go through? And what's kind of amazing is when they did that, Darius, because we have it again in Ezra, he goes back and researches and says, well, let me look into this. And he sees that it was from a decree that told them to go back and build. So after they take this step and they're willing to go through a little bit of hardship, Darius sends back word and he says, they're doing the right thing. And not only are we going to allow them to do it, we're going to empty our treasury to help them do it because it should have been done a long time ago by the decree of King Cyrus. So he helps them as they build this temple to do it even better than they were already doing on their own. But that has to start when they make it the priority, when they say we're going to do this and commit to it. Uh, we're going to be willing to put our necks on the line here a little bit as they go through. Um, and so these, these next few verses I want to read, and then we're going to not wrap up, but start closing out our time because it's not a super long book, but it's just so rich here. Um, in chapter two, it says on the 24th day of the ninth month, this is only a three month window so far. In the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priests what the law says. If someone carries consecrated meat in the fold of their garment and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, olive oil, or other food, does it become consecrated? The priest answered, no. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai said, so it is with this people. And this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. Now, give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone went to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. I struck all the works of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. From this day on, from this 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. 
from this day on, I will bless you. What, what message do you think God is trying to communicate to his people with this analogy at the beginning, this rabbinic teaching almost about defilement and consecration? He asks these questions. If I'm carrying something consecrated in my garment or in my hands or whatever, and it accidentally touches another piece of food, has that piece of food become consecrated? And their answer is, well, no, that's not how it works. And then the second question is, if I'm defiled in some way and I accidentally touch that piece of food, has it become defiled? And their answer is, yes, that's absolutely how defilement works. This analogy that he's giving, and I think it, it speaks to us even now, we don't carry these same laws about cleanliness and defilement, but it is easier to become stained with sin than it is to become holy. We're, we're not holy by association or proximity. We don't find that so long as I'm around this person or doing this thing, it is much easier to become coded or defiled by sin or whatever the thing might be. It's easier to fall down the ladder than to climb up it, I guess is another way to say this here. And we find that in our own lives is it's really easy to let that priority of God, that number one, slip to number two without even really thinking about it. We don't have to be intentional in letting it drop down the ladder. Mm -hmm. You've got to be intentional on raising it up. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen by accident. And I think that's part of what he's saying here is defilement happens easy. Consecration takes intention and thought. It takes, as he said multiple times in these two chapters, careful thought um other people who have your bible open you might have a different translation than i do what phrase is used over and over there um in yours is it that same phrase careful thought like at the end of um chapter or verse 18 in chapter two yeah, just careful, thought. careful thought what does yours say sandy consider. just consider carefully consider. carefully consider it's this idea of give intentional thought to this intentional um i don't even know a, a good synonym for thought but consideration or whatever it might be when it comes to serving god it doesn't happen by accident when it comes to serving god we're not going to look back and say oh geez look at all these things that i've done for god or what what god's done in these ways it happens whenever we make a point to say this is a priority for me um you know I've, I think for myself and for Mandy and I, like in our household, I feel that the most intensely as we're talking about these priorities, when it comes to that question of tithing and when it comes to that question of giving, because that was one where it's so easy to let that be the last stone in the bucket. And it was for me of like, I'd love to do that, but there's this thing, there's this thing, there's this thing, there's this thing. It's just not there. Mm -hmm. And then once you realize that's what you're doing and then say like, I am going to be intentional about this. It's happening on the first Sunday, not the last Sunday of the month. Like this is what we're doing. We're making this commitment. All of a sudden you find the stones fit in the bucket still. Like we're not struggling. We're not starving. We're not hurting for it in that way. And we recognize like, yeah, there's, there's a blessing in making that intentionality. And it's not just about the giving of that or the tithing, like that's a place where I've seen this, but it's so easy to let that unintentionally slip because you say, well, it's just a tight month this month. We had to do, we had to go to Anchorage. It was this and it was that, you know, we had to spend all this extra money. Oh, well, we'll, we'll get it next month. And you say, once you start playing that game, next month has troubles of its own. And you're, you've already set this precedent in your mind. And I think that happens in our giving. It can happen in our worship. Like Darla said, it can happen in our service. It can happen everywhere when we're not intentional about saying, today I am choosing God. And I am choosing God before I choose all those other things. And it doesn't mean those aren't important, but it means they're not more important than God today. And that's a very different thing to, uh, to consider as we go through here. And so... I want to ask just what anybody else is feeling or thinking in Haggai. I love this book. Mm -hmm. 
and I'm upset with myself that more in my Christian life, I have not read Haggai because I feel like all throughout it, I'm like, yeah, this is the Christian life right here. Not just Christian promises, but Christian teaching about what it means to follow God. But does anybody online, Darla, Chris, Mandy, I haven't heard from you guys as much. Um, what are you what are you feeling or thinking as we read this and talk about it? Well, I was wondering in the very beginning when they started to be hassled about building, you know, why they didn't call on God to you know, take care of it, you know, and just keep building. Mm -hmm. they, they seemed to stray and didn't, you know, I mean, they were, they're kind of setting themselves up for <laughs> Haggai coming and telling them, but, um, and that, and that God, I mean, 15 years, you know, he just kind of waiting, kind of patient, you know? Yeah. But I think, yeah. Anytime. You don't put God first. Things just don't go right. And God doesn't scream for the attention either, like other things do. You right. know, we set God aside and God doesn't yell into our ear um, to be put back into number one. We realize that when other things start falling apart around us and we say, what's changed between now and then? But he will if we ask him to, though. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing when you ask that question to God, all the stuff that pops right into your mind no, there. When you ask him to use a two by four on the side of your head. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. If you've gone astray badly enough and you go to the Lord and say, don't let that forever let me get that far away from you ever again. Yeah. I give you permission. And I think that this is maybe um, a gem mm -hmm. that I um, found in my walk with the Lord. Is yeah. That I think that he will. If we, if we ask him to be more authoritative in our lives, I think he will be. Yeah. And I'm not saying that he'll do it in a bad way, but I just feel like I've given that place to God to really speak very loudly to me. Mm -hmm. I think you only make the mistake once or twice when you, when you had an unction to go and talk to somebody and you don't do it and you do you had it again a little bit later and you still don't do it and that person dies yeah it's it really you know and there's been other times too that was way back in my early walk with the lord that those kinds of things happened and finally when a really cataclysmically bad thing happened um caused by me that I just, I went to the Lord and I said, obviously on my own, I'm not very good at making decisions. So I really need you. And I even used the analogy of using a two by four on the yeah. side of my head. Get my attention. God's oh. using some holy lumber there. I like that. <laughs> I like that. No, I think that, and I think that's huge. And hopefully we don't have to experience those catastrophic moments before we yeah. realize that sometimes that's what it takes just to get through our, yeah. our skull at times. But hopefully we can make that corrective before we get to that mm -hmm. point um, as well. But does anybody else have any thoughts or reflections before we wrap up our time? Or questions just about the text that we can discuss or kind of discover together? Okay. Well, next week we are going to be looking at Zechariah and we're going to look, um, that one will break up into a few weeks because it's a longer book, but we'll um, tackle the first chunk of that. So if you'd like to read ahead, please do um, read the first four chapters of Zechariah. Um, they're not very long, but they're these sets of visions that Zechariah has. And we'll kind of talk about those as we're going through, but um, let me say a prayer over us tonight as we close out. I appreciate um, us being able to join together and talk about this. And I hope read Haggai more regularly than you do. That's my final encouragement here because it just, it jumps off the page whenever you do. Um, let's pray together. 
Father, we thank you that your promises are secure, and we thank you that the glory of your house and the glory of your temple isn't built on um, how it looks from the outside or even from the inside, God, but it's about your presence being there, and that means we can be in our closet at home and be in the grandest temple that anyone could ever build. We can be in this room right now. We could be anywhere in the world, God, and it is your temple because your spirit remains with us. That's your promise. We thank you, God, for that your spirit does remain with us, that even when we let it slip and our, our acknowledgement of you and our attention to you slips, you don't leave us. You are there calling us to realize that you have never left in that meantime. So, Father, we ask that you would keep our eyes focused on you, that you would keep our priority focused on you, and that we wouldn't let the 10,000 things that can clamor for our attention distract us from setting you as our top priority, whether it's in worship or service or just our life, God, that we wouldn't let those other things um, call our attention away. So be with us, God. Um, and Haggai here, you promised to shake the nations, shake our hearts, shake our lives. As Sandy said, hit us with that two by four if that's what we need, but keep our eyes focused on you first and foremost in our life, because we know that if you're number one, number two through whatever will take care of themselves because they'll be in your plan. Yes. And if you're not number one, then whatever we place ahead of you is destined to fail because you're not in it and we labor in vain. So we love you, God, and we thank you for your word, for your promise, for your spirit, for your gospel. God, let it completely overtake our lives starting this day and moving forward. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus, and the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All righty. Thank you very much. And y'all have a wonderful night.